The Night Beat starts right now. A mother brutally murdered. The family she leaves behind says they are now left to fend for themselves. Marisol Klingelhofer was shot, dismembered, and burned. Investigators say her killer confessed to the crime. The Night Team's Jonathan Cotto spoke with Klingelhofer's daughter, who shares she sensed something was wrong from the moment her mother disappeared. I was praying, God, God, let me be wrong, and I hope she's somewhere in the hospital and she got in an accident or something. Priscilla Gonzalez devastated by the loss of her mother, Marisol Klingelhofer. She remembers her as a caring and humble person, always willing to help others. Gonzalez reported her mom missing on May 7th. The last time she had heard from her was on April 26th. She says she immediately suspected the worst possible outcome. I told everybody, I was like, my mom's gone. The beginning of May, I was already grieving. Gonzalez's gut instinct proving her right to several witnesses leading multiple law enforcement agencies to this Atascosa property. The investigation ultimately leading to 36-year-old Andres Perez Tarnava III confessing to killing Klingelhofer. An arrest affidavit said that he believed Klingelhofer stole items that belonged to his father. I don't know what happened that day. We don't know, nobody knows, and nobody has the right to judge my mother. Tarnava gave investigators a detailed description of what happened to Klingelhofer. He said he shot, burned her body, then tried to hide the remains in barrels. The arrest affidavit says a witness also told investigators Tarnava admitted to dismembering the body. This man seemed like he had, he knew what he was doing, like if he's killed before. Amid her loss, Gonzalez says God forgives Tarnava, but justice must be served. Tomorrow's not promised, and never we never imagined that this was going to be like this, you know? It's shocking, very shocking. I didn't expect it to be this way. Investigators say Tarnava showed no remorse for murdering Marisol Klingelhofer. We're outside of the Bear County Jail, where Tarnava will be remaining tonight. Reporting live, Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Jonathan. Now to a Defenders update. More people are leaving CPS Energy following the deadly February storms. The Defenders learning that Utilities Chief Legal Officer and General Counsel is on the way out. But she's not the only one leaving, apparently. In a statement, CPS Energy says in part, quote, recently several executives, including our Chief Legal Officer, have decided to leave the company. We are grateful for their many contributions over their tenure and wish them the very best, end quote. Chief Legal Officer Carolyn Shellman has worked for CPS Energy since 2006. It is unclear when an end date for her position would happen. This is the now the second departure announced from the utility we've reported on in less than a month. Chief Financial Officer Gary Gold set to retire and leave CPS at the end of June. We're working to find out who else is choosing to leave. The exits come as CPS Energy faces several lawsuits related to the February storms. The utility also faces more than a billion dollars in bills from the storm and is fighting those charges in court. For now, CPS Energy has not decided to raise energy rates, but the option is still available for the future. We'll continue to keep you updated both on air and online at KSAT.com. His own home is gone. His neighbor's car is torched. Eric Fox Hernandez faces arson charges in both cases. He was released from jail on the condition he wear an ankle monitor. Today, he appeared in court with his father who cares for him. Mark Hernandez says his son has autism and suffers from seizures. An attorney for Eric Fox Hernandez argued because of the supervision from his father, there was no need for a GPS ankle monitor. The judge says the monitor will remain on to track Hernandez, but the fees will be removed along with the perimeter that often accompanies ankle monitors. Both father and son have had to stay, stay in a motel or a hotel rather following the fires in Leon Valley back in April. Homeless tent cities have become more visible across Texas in the last year, including here in San Antonio. This one near the Alamo Dome grew to dozens during the peak of the pandemic. Homeless encampments are expected to be banned across the state. They're already illegal in San Antonio, but some are concerned the bill the state legislature passed will lead to criminalizing the homeless population. The 19's Patty Santos explains our city and local nonprofits hope to keep compassion in their plan. 
I think the, the, the largest challenge um, for us with uh, the potential for this bill is, is the, the concept of criminalization of homelessness or criminalization of poverty. Nikisha Baker with Sam Ministry says much is still unknown about whether House Bill 1925 will have any impact on San Antonio. You know, we're going to look at it very closely with our lawyers just to make sure uh, all of our practices do align with uh, the new legislation. We've got a few months now to do that. The bill headed to the governor's desk for signing will ban public camping, making it a class C misdemeanor. There's a fine of up to $500. The bill also requires cities to offer homeless people help. We have a camping ban in our local ordinances, but we only enforce it when there's a health or safety issue. We've had this law in place since uh, 2005. The bill also talks about doing street outreach and providing services first. The city of San Antonio and outreach organizations say they're already a step ahead with a five-year strategic plan to work on affordable housing and are back out doing street outreach. I was out under I-37 in Brooklyn um, this afternoon and there are still tents and there are still folks in those tents who may or may not for whatever reason be good candidates for the system. Just making something illegal doesn't make it uh, go away. Local leaders say building relationships, trust and making a dent in ending homelessness will take time and resources. We really want to focus on the long term solutions because when you clear a camp, people are just moving to another area until you have that permanent housing option. And to ensure that federal funds dealing with homeless prevention are well spent, the city of San Antonio is teaming up with several providers to ensure that those in need have one central location where they can turn to. This, uh, our community is one of a few nationwide that is using this kind of system. You can read more about it on ksat.com. Steve Isis. Thank you, Patty. Governor Greg Abbott issued a disaster declaration for border, border counties, two border towns with a difference of opinion when it comes to the border. The mayors of Laredo and Del Rio agree more resources are needed for local and federal agencies to address the flow of migrants. But when it comes to calling it a disaster, that's where they differ. I recognize the national security disaster that's happening here along the border. For us, it's not a disaster because it's manageable, still manageable. The governor says the declaration provides border counties with funding and strategies they need. And looking outside right now, we do have a few storms off to the northeast of San Antonio, especially closer to Austin. That's where most of the action is right now, and that's where we've had some severe weather up toward Round Rock. You look into the hill country, a few isolated showers made their way into Kerr County and Kendall County, but they're having a hard time staying alive, and they're dissipating as they head toward us. So our, I think our rain chances are pretty slim here in the coming hours. We do have some development in Zavala County at this time, and there are some indications that we could have a little further development through the night closer to San Antonio. Odds are slim. There's just that slight chance. We've got the 20 to 30% chance in overnight. What I'm really focusing on is the activity that's coming together in New Mexico and West Texas. I think that gives us bigger and higher rain chances as we get into tomorrow. We're going to time out that and more storm chances coming up. Thank you, Adam. The vaccine rollout will need to pick up speed if President Joe Biden hopes to reach one of his goals. He announced 70% of the United States would have at least one dose of vaccine by the 4th of July holiday. Now he hopes the National Month of Action will help get us there. Starting next week, many vaccination sites will be offering extended hours during the month of June, including pharmacies that will be open 24 hours every Friday night. Incentives also being offered to encourage vaccinations. Major League Baseball will be offering free tickets to people who get vaccinated at the ballpark. Anheuser-Busch offering a free beer for a shot. And right now, about 63% of the adult population has received at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. About 41% of the U.S. population is fully vaccinated. Well, some of you may still have questions about vaccines. Our KSAT Community Phone Bank will help get you answers to those questions this Friday. Dr. Jason Bowling, Director of Hospital Epidemiology from University Health, will be addressing your questions, concerns, and answering 
any questions you have in Friday's KSAT Q&A. The phone bank, meantime, is this Friday from 5 to 7 p.m. We'll be providing the number to call later this week. You can find more information on KSAT.com. It's still ahead on the night beat. Remember Blade, the service dog? He disappeared six months ago. You won't believe where he was found. His Lavernia family providing the heartwarming update. Coming up. Plus, a new candidate hoping to leave his Texas state seat to take another. Who George P. Bush wants to push out of office. Coming up. And a bike ride interrupted by a shooting. Police say a Texas mother, the gunman, who she was aiming at and the innocent victim who was hit. Next on the Night Beat. A mother armed with a gun shoots her own five year old son. Police say the mother was aiming for a loose dog. It happened in the Houston area as the mother, son and father were riding their bicycles in the neighborhood Saturday. One neighbor says he opened his door and his six month old boxer burst out of the home. Neighbors say the mother started firing. Officers say Angelia Vargas fired three bullets. One of them ricocheted and hit her son in the stomach. The little boy expected to survive. The dog was grazed. Vargas is now facing criminal charges of deadly conduct. Texas lawmakers just passed new legislation allowing people 21 and older to carry a handgun in public without a permit. The permitless carry bill was sent to Governor Greg Abbott for his signature last month. Well, one man hoping to shake up a major race in the Lone Star State, Texas Land Commissioner George P. Bush announcing he will run for attorney general. He plans on taking on incumbent Ken Paxton, who is facing his own legal troubles. But in our times here in Texas, we have a scandal that's play, plaguing one of our highest offices. And I believe conservatives should have a choice in the Republican primary. George P. Bush is pro-Trump and even used the past president's words in tonight's speech saying drain the swamp. Former President Donald Trump has said he likes both Bush and Paxton. He plans to make his endorsement announcement soon. Ken Paxton has denied any wrongdoing. Meanwhile, at least one Democrat is also running in the 2022 race. Former Galveston Mayor Joe Jaworski announced his campaign. What does pride mean for San Antonio and what work still needs to be done? It's a discussion we took on in hopes of leading to understanding during Pride Month. We had two panelists for tonight's virtual town hall, sociology and anthropology professor D Dr. Amy Stone with Trinity University has written several books over LGBTQ plus matters and executive director of the Pride Center, Robert Salcedo. Pride Month holds so much history within the LGBTQ community, from the Stonewall riots to the Supreme Court ruling to help protect the community against discrimination in the workplace. Take that next step to educate yourself a little bit more and gain additional knowledge on who our community is. You will find that we are loving people uh, just like anybody else. I think that Pride Month is a great time to learn more about the LGBTQ community and what we're all about. We discuss the diversity within the community as well as pronouns and some of the progress and challenges that still remain. You can watch the entire discussion online at ksat.com. Now to a heartwarming night beat update. A Lavernia family finally getting their service dog back after he disappeared six months ago. We first told you about Blade in January. He belongs to 16 year old Caitlin Bovard. She has Down syndrome. She's had to undergo several reconstructive surgeries and Blade was an important part of her recovery. A storm last November scared him off and soon after flyers were printed off and sent out as that search began. Well, just last Thursday, a farmer contacted the family saying Blade was found eating molasses with several cows on his fenced in farmland just two miles away from Bovaird's home. Blade actually saw us. He started crying, this high-pitched cry. He was jumping up and, and trying to kiss us. Uh, I'm so tired of him tapping, surprised. He's home. Blade lost 30 pounds but survived February's winter storms. The community's already started sending him care packages. The family says they are beyond thankful for everyone's support. 
And we are very Great happy. Great news. We're very happy Blade is back home. Indeed. Meantime, let's take a live look outside towards the Alamo Dome right now with Sky 12. 79 degrees out there, Adam. Sunny day we had today. We ended up getting yeah. a decent amount of sunshine, though we still only made it into the mid 80s for a high temperature. Let's talk about our headlines. More storms are likely, especially as we get into the day tomorrow. Some heavy downpours, and I really think flash flooding is the primary concern going forward here tomorrow, Friday, Friday night, and even on into Saturday. You know, I love this third line. The aquifer, as of today, up 21.6 feet since April 21st, and it should continue to rise. Let's take a look at the radar, and I showed you earlier some activity that was especially up near Austin. We had some severe weather closer to Austin and Lake LBJ area. We were on the tail end of that batch of storms in parts of the hill country, and it really had a hard time holding together. Near Canyon Lake, one little downpour has just popped up, but you see this outflow boundary, it's kicking southward. That's the wind that's basically being exhaled from that storm getting pushed southward and there's a pre-existing boundary near Seguin. These could come together and it wouldn't surprise me if they sprout and develop a few showers and thunderstorms, but generally garden variety, just some heavy rain along with a little bit of lightning and thunder in the next coming couple of hours. Here's the bigger picture, wider view. We talked about some of that development west of I-35 south of town. Not a big deal, isolated. It's having a hard time really, really sustaining itself. Our focus is shifting to New Mexico and West Texas. That's where we're anticipating more organization of these storms and them to come together and then move our way through the night, make it here about late morning and even on into the afternoon. So there's that activity near Lubbock, stretching southward all the way down into the I-20 and even I-10 corridor. Let's take a look at our future cast. It initializes pretty well with this action. I mean, look, 11 o'clock and it shows it right there just about where it is right now. And it is anticipating a little bit of development around San Antonio tonight, say midnight, 1, 2 a.m. There's so many boundaries out there, we just can't rule it out, but I think it's a little aggressive in exactly what it shows. If anything, we could have a few downpours pop up and maybe some cracks of thunder that just wake you up and that would be it. I think the main focus will be this batch of storms coming in from West Texas and then it affecting us late morning and on into the afternoon tomorrow. Of course, it's going to modify throughout the night and throughout the day tomorrow, but we're expecting that scattered activity to pick up in nature late morning and after and into the afternoon on your Thursday and notice those rain and storm chances are high 60% Thursday, Friday and Saturday. That doesn't mean an all day event, but we'll have those batches of showers and storms. So mid 80s for the high today, 86. That's below the average of 91. Right now we're at 80 degrees, dew point of 67. 80 locally, 67 in Kerrville, 63 in Fredericksburg, the outflow there. Meanwhile, still 81 Catula and Laredo. And as we go through tomorrow, we'll start the day near 70. And I think most of the day will be spent in the 70s, maybe very briefly hitting 80. But notice how those storm chances peak at 60% late morning through the noon hour and on into the afternoon. Again, heavy downpours periodically will be the primary threat here with the potential for some flash flooding often on Friday, Friday night and even into Saturday. And then thereafter, still some rain chances, but falling off a bit. All right. Thank you, Adam. All right. You know, I think of Larry Coker as the guy that started UTSA football, but he also won a national championship. He sure did while he was at Miami, and now he's going to be honored, we hope, in his call to the hall, the College Football Hall of Fame. In fact, his name went on the ballot today. When we come back, more about that. And Smithson Valley Rangers get a big send-off today to the regionals. Coming up. The man who founded UTSA football, Larry Coker, is one of seven coaches who are on the 2022 ballot for induction into the College Football Hall of Fame. That announcement made today by the National Football Foundation and the College Hall of Fame. Coker was hired as the first head football coach in UTSA history on March 6, 2009 and started that program from scratch. After a practice season in 2010, Roadrunners kicked off their first ever football season with a 31-3 defeat of Coker's alma mater, Northeastern State, in front of over 56,000 fans in the Alamo Dome, where the Roadrunners averaged over 35,000 fans in their inaugural season season. Under Coker's guidance, the Roadrunners doubled their wins in the second season, the 8-4 finish before his run at UTSA that ended in 2015. Coker was a head coach of the Miami Hurricanes from 2001 to 2006, where he won the national championship in his first year, was named national
National Coach of the Year twice in both 2001 and 2002. Reaction on social media was so positive this afternoon after hearing of Coach Larry Coker's nomination for the College Football Hall of Fame. Current UTSA head coach Jeff Trailer tweeted this out. Grateful for all Larry Coker did for UTSA football, continues to do from Travis Bush, who is now the head football coach at Braffles Canyon and worked for Coker as his offensive coordinator in 2011, tweeted this out as well. Blessed to have had the opportunity to work for Larry Coker. Can't even explain how much I learned. He was an amazing coach and an even better man. Hashtag respect. The winningest coach in Division I basketball history, Mike Krzyzewski of Duke, will retire at the end of the coming 2021-2022 season. That was confirmed today by the university. In 41 seasons at Duke, Coach K has led the Blue Devils to five national championships and the Naismith Hall of Fame coach has 1,097 career wins at Duke, taking the teams to the Final Four 12 times, has won 12 regular season ACC championships, 15 conference tournament titles, while producing 28 NBA lottery picks and 41 first-round selections along the way. The 74-year-old coach will be replaced by his associate head coach, John Shire, who played for Coach K from 2006 to 2010. Reporters caught up with former North Carolina head coach Roy Williams after the Pro-Am of the Corn Ferry Tour stop in Raleigh, after announcing his retirement in April to get his own reaction to his rival's retirement. Mike's been fantastic for the game of basketball. He's been fantastic for college basketball. Been fantastic for the ACC, the greatest rivalry in sports, Duke, North Carolina basketball. Uh, he's been a good friend. He's been a guy I've respected a great deal. He made everybody bring their A game for years and years and years. So he's just been phenomenal in everything he's done. Uh, uh, the only thing wrong with Mike Krzyzewski is he doesn't play golf. <laughs> Coach K is not the only high-profile basketball figure retiring one day after the Boston Celtics season came to an end in the first round of the NBA playoffs. Danny Ainge announced his retirement as a president of the Celtics and is turning that over to Brad Stevens, who is leaving the sidelines to move to the front office. The search is underway now to find a new head coach for the Boston Celtics. Kentucky Derby winner Medina Spirit has had a second blood sample test positive for the steroid betamethasone, which is use is banned on race day that's according to the new york times which means two things the two positive results could lead to medina spirit being disqualified as a winner of the kentucky derby and if that happens second place mandaloon would be declared the new winner and two hall of famer trainer by the way bob baffert has now been suspended for two years by churchill downs the smithson valley rangers get that big send off today coming up we caught up with the Rangers. They departed Smithson Valley High School today with a huge send-off as they head for Corpus Christi where they will meet Los Fresnos in a winner-take-all one-game matchup tomorrow afternoon to decide who goes to state in the Class 6A high school baseball playoffs. As after the Rangers defeated Eagle Pass 13-6 to sweep the Eagles in the Region 4 semifinals and now advance to the regional finals for the first time since 2005. Now, one of the standouts in that game was Tim Arguello, who went 4-5 for five with four RBIs, who was also the Rangers' starting pitcher in a game that was stretched over two days due to weather. Now they have to get by Los Fresnos to get to state uh, we know that I mean they play one games every series in playoffs for the most part and they have one pitcher who's been locking it down for them and we know we're gonna face him so we got to be prepared for that there's no other way that I'd want to start off my summer than to be playing high school baseball right now and especially being able to go to Corpus right now and miss out on summer vacations it's just what I've been living for my whole high school career yeah, they're out of school. Battle up between Smith Valley and Los Fresos is set for 4 p.m. tomorrow at Cabinets Complex in Corpus Christi. UIL Baseball Playoffs 2A Region 4 Finals. Shiner, by the way, defeated Samadal 5-1. Game 2 tomorrow at 5 p.m. in Jordanton to the Class 1A State Softball Championship game at the Red and Charlene McCombs Field in Austin. The defending champion to Hannes Cowgirls taking on Dodge City Hornets and the Hornets sting in the fourth inning. Journey Hilliard, RBI single, makes it 8-1 game, but to Hannes fights back. In the sixth, Tony Burrell gets the RBI single to lift the score here and let's score Alicia Garcia and the lead is now down to six. Same inning. Keller Ruiz going opposite field brings home Jolie Frosch and it's eight to three. Next inning Marissa Santos hits a line drive that bounces off the wall that will score Mabry Herman and the Hornets now lead is down to four but that's as close as they would get. The Cowgirls bid for a second consecutive title falls short eight to four. Not many kids in their high school career get to go to state three times pretty much in a row. We probably would have gone a fourth time if COVID would have happened. And yeah. I was lucky enough to be one of those kids to come back my freshman, sophomore, and my senior year. And it means a lot, even though we got second place. All right. Congratulations on a great season. Absolutely. Thank you, Greg. We'll be right back. That's it for the night beat. GMSA at 4-3. Good night.